Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 106, Surprisingly Easy Board Games. Games that were easier to grasp than expected. I'm Sean, who's not good at Jeopardy, and with me, who's proven shockingly skilled, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I like to welcome everyone here in the lobby here on Twitch. You can too can join us Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. All right, tonight's topic is a follow-up from our topic on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 103, Surprisingly Complex Games, where we talked about games that look like they'd be too simple or too fun to actually be enjoyable, but were actually really solid games. Tonight, we're looking at the opposite side of that coin, surprisingly easy games. Games that look complicated and hard to learn, but are actually quite easy to grasp. Once we get to the game room, we'll be taking a look at the Trade and Intrigue expansion. That's a second expansion for Orléans, followed by four, uh, Flick Wars, which is a dexterity-based strategy war game. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We appreciate your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, you can send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Or you can hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop One Word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, a comment on one of our earliest topics on Tech at the Table. David Hutchinson, Hutchinson writes, I agree with all the benefits, but the distraction can be demoralizing if, when it comes to a person's turn, as you mentioned, they didn't prepare what they were doing ahead of time. The game can come to a screeching halt, and as a, res as a resource to call upon at a moment's notice, it's great but it should then be put back down so that focus can be on your fellow players. Interacting with fellow players really brings a game to life. Oh, thanks for your comment, Dave. Uh, as usual, what we'll do is we'll toss a link to that previous article and podcast in the show notes. Well, up next, a couple of comments on our Talisman Batman review. First, Chris Groff says, Great review, and I think you were right about the one thing, about one thing, well, more than one, but this particular one. <laughs> You either like Talisman or you don't. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much you skin it, it's still Talisman. Also kind of like Munchkin in that regard. Next, David Fox had this to say. Another option I'm thinking of is to get some Batman deck protectors and combining all the decks like in classic Talisman and just drawing from a single deck. Well, thanks for the comments, both uh, David and Chris there. Uh, Munchkin, that is another game that I think you have to play for the experience to enjoy it. And it's definitely not for anyone. I am I am not a big fan. Despite I am a Talisman fan, Munchkin just, no, I'm kind of past that one. Now, regarding David's suggestion of mixing all the cards in Talisman Batman, I will say that would work. And it's definitely better than the way the game is now when you first get it. Though I did like the progression from floor one to four or two. Like the, the two decks definitely did have a step up. And I just be, I'm still more tempted to just mix the three and the two deck together, the, the last two decks. And I don't know what you do for sleeves. Maybe get some Joker sleeves and some Batman sleeves. So the Joker sleeves are the final floors or something like that. I'm sure there's a way to do it. Well, now on to our 878 Vikings unboxing video, which got a couple of comments like this one from Neil Robinson. Blame the Kickstarter for the miniatures. They were a stretch goal. At some point, I will buy some wooden cubes as replacements, as it will make army management that bit easier. Then Doug Sartori added, This is one of my favorite of these Academy games, Birth of Series games, so far, tense and dynamic. Well, thanks for the comments, Doug and Neil. Uh, I gotta say, I was worried about the miniatures. Like, the, we used to call these games for years the Academy Game Block War Games, and you can't really call it a block war game when one of them doesn't have blocks in it anymore. Um, I actually thought, looking at the miniatures on the Kickstarter, they were going to fall over all the time. They just looked like they were like top-heavy in a way, but they actually worked better than I expected. For one, they're well-balanced. They have nice large bases, and they're tiny. Like These are mini miniatures. Like They're not much larger than a standard wooden cube as it is. 
I, I thought I'd hate them, but I don't. I actually didn't mind them at all. Now, as for Doug, I have to say I was very impressed by the back and forth you get in Vikings, with especially with every round, another wave of Vikings coming onto the map and where the English kind of beat them back or get beaten back and then kind of recover a bit and then get beaten back again and recover a bit. I did like that back and forth. But overall, I still think I may prefer 1812 Invasion of Canada for this series of games. What I really need to do, though, is play Vikings with more than two players. Thus far, the pandemic has prevented getting more than a two-player game in, but I would love to try that at the full player count to see if that improves the uh, my enjoyment of the game. Well, next up, another comment about an unboxing video, this time Animal Empire. Board Game Grand writes, Half Monster Games are from right here in my home city of Brisbane. So it was cool to see this. I hate when my camera focus won't cooperate. Thanks for the unboxing. Well, thanks for the comment, Grand. And I got to tell you, this camera right here has been driving me nuts lately. Although, don't don't be angry at tonight. We have fantastic video from you tonight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, a comment on Board Game Geek from Glenn Darren about our first Jaws of the Lion video, where we talk about the differences between it and Gloomhaven. Glenn writes, very nice breakdown of the difference between JOTL and full Gloomhaven. I'm getting ready to start Scenario 3, and I hadn't been aware of any errata. Thanks, and great job. Well, thanks, Glenn. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks, you, to everyone who shares comments and interacts with our content. A few quick announcements before we continue. I just want to state for the record that we have no plans to inspect your games to make sure you put all the components away in the correct places. It's a completely unfounded rumor, though we will look at you sternly if you just wipe everything off the table into the box and put the lid on in front of us. I've seen people do that. It's cringeworthy. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email that recaps all the content we put out in the previous week. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, actual plays, unboxings, etc. It's all there. You can sign up by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking in the sidebar or go over to newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com. A uh, quick reminder that our next AMA uh, live Q&A will be at the end of this month on the last Wednesday of the month, which this month would be September the 30th. We would love to play your question on air. So you can send us a voicemail through Skype to Sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. I would love to be able to play those out. I think that'd be just a, a, another step up for our interaction with you fine folks. All right, this past week, it became official. We have been approved for partner status on YouTube. A huge thank you to everyone who has watched and subscribed to our channel and made this possible. Now, what we thought would be cool, uh, a cool way to celebrate is by rewarding one of you by giving away a copy of one of our favorite games, something that both of us have greatly enjoyed playing with our families. So we've got a sealed copy of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle from the op here that we are going to send out to a winner. Now, due to the cost of shipping, I am sad to say we're going to have to limit this to people living in the U.S. or Canada. Due to, uh, yep. Yeah. So to head over, head over to the blog at, to enter, head over to the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on the pinned post. Now, for this contest, you are going to have to be a YouTube subscriber. That's kind of the whole point, right? We're celebrating the fact that we we uh, we hit partner status on YouTube. But we will be giving away additional entries for following us on social media, subscribing to our newsletter, all the usual stuff you see at a, with a giveaway like this. As an added bonus for you awesome folk who joined us here live on Twitch this Wednesday night, I have just dropped a code into the chat for two bonus entries. Good luck, everyone. We love people who drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. If you are here live, remember to stick around as we continue the show after the double bell with more chat and content that otherwise only our patrons get. I don't have anything specifically planned for tonight's show. No packages have shown up. I do have some stuff that should be showing up at some point. Some review copies I'm waiting to get in, but we haven't gotten anything. Not a lot going in the chat so far. We were just talking about earlier, uh, Sean and I on Monday were involved on an online game show, which was pretty interesting, a Jeopardy-like show. So that that explains Sean's little intro there at the beginning of the show. Uh, it, I, I did particularly well answering board game-related questions, better than I thought I would. I was expecting a little more trivia and a little less, I don't know, board game general knowledge, I guess, is, is more the way it went. 
Uh, not surprisingly, the reason we do this show is because of Mo's general knowledge in board games, and he showed it, racking up the highest ever score for that channel's uh, event, game gaming yeah. event, uh, both in the regular round and then again in the lightning round to finish it all off. So, so uh, when that comes to YouTube, we will be promoting that everywhere so everyone can go take a look at us making fools of ourselves and uh, Mo winning handily. Yes, I do have to thank Brent McBride, uh, Brent Frank McBride, for having us on his show. This is something he's been doing. He runs a local escape room that, of course, was hurting due to the COVID pandemic. And this is something he started up to keep himself busy in the past time. Now, most of the shows are video game based, so he'll have like a bunch of Fortnite players on and do Fortnite trivia. Uh, I know he's also done League of Legends. This was his first time doing tabletop games, and it was a pleasure to be able to join him. So thanks for that, Brent. Absolutely. And you can check check out his Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash the underscore Frank spelled P-H-R-A-N-K. Are we ready to jump in? Yep. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost in the mix. They don't end up in the wrong folder or anything like that. Or I just don't see them, miss them in the scrolling guy on Twitter of data that's just constantly going by. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight's topic comes from Facebook, where Dan Walker asked, looking for suggestions on games that seem heavier than they actually are. All right, so when I saw this question on Facebook, I totally read it completely wrong. I went on to reply to uh, Dan and talk all about games that surprised me by how much of a game they were and link Dan to our article about games that surprised us and that were surprisingly complex. The problem with this was that wasn't what Dan was asking. Yeah, I totally did that wrong, jumped the gun, and was talking about games that were more complex. And that was our topic from a couple weeks ago, episode 103 of our podcast, which, of course, we'll throw a link to. And I felt a little embarrassed. Once my error was pointed out, though, I was looking at it going, well, then I should link you to our article. Of, well, wait, we haven't covered that yet. You know what? This is actually a really good follow-up. So that's why we're here today. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Some more games that surprised us, but surprised us by being simpler, quicker, easier, and or less complex than they seem at first blush. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So what I, I actually love the feeling of sitting down to a big, heavy game, right? Something that's taken up your whole table. There's tons of counters. There's resource sheets there's just stuff everywhere there's a huge rule book and like i'm actually intimidated to play and i'm like oh i don't know but then you start playing and you're like wow this isn't that bad at all i love that feeling like to me those are some of the best games in my collection those games that are, are meaty enough with good decision points and lots of player agency that aren't overwhelming or too complicated or bog you down or make you think too much so it's work like, I love a meaty game, but what I like more is a meaty game that you can digest a bit at a time with plenty of onboarding that just makes the game so much easier to eat. Well, now, unfortunately, this could also encompass games that look like big, beefy, brainy games and are nothing but rolling moves. But we're going to mm. focus on games that are also good <laughs> and lighter than we expect. Very fair. Very fair. We will do that. So I'm going to start with the first game that came to mind when I first read this topic. Well, once I realized the proper version of this topic, and that was Anachrony, because I had to say this is one of the most overwhelming and intimidating games I own when you first start setting it up. It's just, it's huge. It's a table hog. And then one of the concepts of the game is it's about time travel and you can send yourself resources from the future as long as you pay them back later. And that just sounds like it's going to be mechanically clunky and, and hard to understand and difficult to, to think about. But what Anachrony does to help with this is a very slow build, especially at the start of the game. You start with limited resources at your disposal, basically not enough to afford what you probably want to do later. And your initial actions are limited as well on what you're going to be able to do. So you're going to have to take your initial actions to just build up those resources to be able to unlock the rest of the game in a way. And what that does is limits the decision tree at the beginning of the game. You're only going to have a possibility of going six different action spots. And with other players taking up some of those spots, your choices are going to go down as every other player goes. And then new options only unlock once you've started to actually build your engine. 
this is the one game that every single time I have taught this game, and I, I like to run this game at uh, Great Canadian Board Game Blitz tournaments, is players will stop me, usually in the second turn, sometimes in the third turn, and always say something to the effect of, wow, this isn't as bad as I expected, or, oh, I thought this was going to be way worse than it is, or, man, when you first started describing this, I was scared. It's really not that bad. This is one of the games that I see mentioned all the time when people talk about games they were scared of that ended up being okay or perfectly fine. Yeah, so I have to say, I, Anachrony seems like one of these games for sure, because you keep saying it's easy to teach, but every time you have explained this game on the mm-hmm. show, my brain just cringes <laughs> and, 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 and tries to grasp the concept of time traveling resources. Um, so it's definitely, you know, from, from the way you explain it as being so <laughs> easy, uh, it almost has to be because the, the lengths of explaining it True. are really, you know, brain bendy. And that was... <laughs> anachrony all right up next a game that i love way more than i thought and i got i i was a late adopter of this game this game has been out for a while and i just fell in love with it last year and that is raiders of the north sea from renegade games this is a worker placement game based on vikings um and it's one of those you sit there and you look at the board and if you've never played the game before and you're like, oh, what the heck? There's three different tracks on the side of the board. Who knows what they're tracking? Three different things you got to keep track of. You got these pile of cards. You got five cards in your hands. You got this board in front of you that you have to put your people on. Then you got these spots all over the board with little miking meeple staying next to one, just piles of resources. And there's all these different resources and there's just stuff everywhere. And it can be very overwhelming for new players. But then once you learn it, like the basic mechanic of this game is put a meeple on the map and do the action at that spot, then take a meeple off the map and do an action at that spot. Now to make things easier, and again, we get into the onboarding of this game, is you only have the lowest level of meeple. There's three different levels and you have no Vikings to go raiding yet. So your initial options again are very limited. It's only after you've got some crew and provisions and a few higher level Vikings that all of the options are opened up to the players. Yeah, no, Raiders of the North Sea is another one where I I have just been hesitant to even ask to sit down and play that one because of the uh, the curve. But I, everything I've heard about it has made it sound like just a such a fantastic game. And that is Raiders of the North Sea. All right, up next, I've got Orléans, or Orleans, depending on who you ask. Uh, This is one of my favorite games of all time. Like, this is probably a top five game for me, if not higher. I don't rank my games in order, really. I just, it's up there. And I actually played some of this just this weekend, which we'll hear more about later in the show. But man, can this game intimidate people. And I got to witness this firsthand on the weekend because I was introducing it to my mother-in-law. Now, a big part of this is the setup scares people. There are a lot of things on this board. You put this board out, there's a number of little round followers you stack up, the piles of goods. You have to seed the board with goods. And then there's the fact everyone's given their own player board with a whole bunch of different worker placement spots on them that are all with no words, just iconography. And then there's the whole beneficial deeds board over on the side, right? Like there's just a lot going on. The thing is, this is another game, and this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the night, is where your starting stuff severely limits your actions at the start of the game. For one, you don't start with monks, scholars, or knights. That's three types of the the worker placement spots, three types of the followers that you need to do stuff you don't even have. So don't even worry about those spots if you don't have those follower types. And then this carries on for the first few turns, because even if the first turn you get a knight, well, now you can unlock the few spots that have knights, but you still don't have scholars, right? And so on. Then there's also the fact that the beneficial deeds board, that's mainly uh, used later in the game for thinning down your bag. Well, you're not going to thin your bag at the start of the game. For one, it's just not a good move. But second, you actually can't send your founding figures or your founding followers to the board. You can't ever promote them. So you can't even take that option. So it's, it's that ramping up, right? So that you're always limited throughout the entire game. You're never going to be able to do every auction because you're only going to draw max eight followers out of your bag. And that's going to limit what you can do. You can never do all the things. And it's limiting those decisions that makes this game way more approachable than it seems. And it's also a good game where you can kind of teach it as you play because of those limited options of the game. It's like, look, you have these four people. Here's your possibilities and why you might want to do those. Okay, now that you've got one of those, here's the other thing you can do. Yeah, I have to say the first time you opened up Orleans in front of me, I was hesitant. Uh, It's one of those games where 
I would probably end up liking it. Or when I first see it, I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun, but it's going to take a game or two for me to figure mm-hmm. out what the heck's going on before I can actually start enjoying it. And that wasn't the case at all. Mm-hmm. I finished that first game confident that I both knew what I was doing and that I really did like the game mm-hmm. all from that very first play. So uh, I definitely think Orleans fits this one for my personal experience as well. And that is Orleans or Orleans. Next, Zolkin the Mayan calendar. All right, this one's weird because compared to the other games in the list, I can't tell you what secret Zolkin designers use to make this sing, like to make it work as well as it does. Now, thinking about it, I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that what you can do is what's left after the other players have gone. So like, yeah, the first player's got some hard choices, but like a lot of the times it's like, well, I need grain, but I can't. And I want this and I can't, so what's left? So that's one part that kind of limits it. Um, And then it's the ability to adapt what you're doing to. So a lot of uh, the game kind of feels like uh, playing to see what's going to happen. Like you don't have a set. You're like, I need some corn. Not I'm going to take that corn spot. It's I need some corn. So I'm going to put it on the gear to get corn and we'll kind of see where that goes. So it might be planning to get it in the second spot, but then something else opens up. So you leave your guy in the corn board a little longer. So I, I think that's an aspect of it. Um, also the fact that you start pretty basic, like you start off, you know, you're going to have to feed your workers. So everyone's going to need some corn. You can't build buildings without stone. So you have some general, everyone's kind of got to do them things, but then you can say branch out. You're like, well, I don't necessarily need the corn or whatever now. So I can work on the God tracks. I don't know. It's, it's hard to describe. This is one you have to kind of play to see it, whatever it is, whenever I teach this game, someone always points out that it's much easier to inspect it. Now, maybe it's just the intimidation factor. Maybe those all those gears that turn around just scare people away. I'm not sure what the what it is, but I have had many people many times tell me that Zolkin is a much simpler game than they were expecting. Well, I think part of it, I mean, Zolkin's uh, medium heavy. Um, yeah. I, I don't know what it's not. It's probably close to a four uh, on Board Game Geek. Wow. Um, and I have to say, again, it, it appears terrifying. Uh, I, I haven't sat down and, and gotten Zulkin, uh out yet, uh, although I should probably do a, a read through and we can try it on Board Game Arena. Um, mm-hmm. it, it definitely is a, a scary looking board, but it's just a worker placement. It has an interesting aging technique through the mm-hmm. gears, but it's just a worker placement. Um, so once you get over the hump of the terrifying look of it, um, again, a worker placement is still a worker placement. Yeah, the only thing it really adds, it's not in most. Uh, the only other game I know that uses is the Manhattan Project is eventually you run out of workers and you have to spend a turn taking them back, right. which is a neat mechanic. It's You can keep putting them out, but eventually you have to take them off. And it's when you take them off, they activate, not when you put them on. Right. So it's, it's, it's got some neat twists. No, nowadays, it, like other games have done it, right? Raiders of the North Sea kind of uses that. But it does both. It does put right. it on and take off. Well, that was Zulkin, uh, the Mayan calendar. Now, here's one that blows me away every time I sit down to try to play it by how thin the rule book is and just really how little rules are in the game. And that is the Brass series. Now, I'm going to specifically call it Brass Lancashire because that's considered the best of the series. But this goes back to the original Brass as well as both of the updated versions. These are brilliant games. These are some of the best games I have ever played. Well-balanced, awesomely designed games by Martin Wallace. And these games are awesome for a number of reasons. But one is how quickly you can teach this game. Each round, players are only going to take two actions, and those actions are driven and limited by the cards they have in their hands. And it's pretty simple. If you have the name of a place, you can build there. And if you have a a building type, you can build that building type. Like, there's not a lot of options there. There's only, I think, three or four different possible moves. And each actual possible move, each action, is really simple. It's like put something out on the board, flip something over, maybe spend some resources. It's not the mechanics that make brass the heavy game that it is. It's learning how to use them. While you may not figure out the strategy the first few times you play this game, you may not be good at it, you're going to pick up how to do everything quickly and easy. It's the figure out when and why that's the learning curve in this game, not learning how to play. Uh, Interestingly, uh, on Board Game Geek, Birmingham has the higher geek score. 
Okay, maybe I'm confused. I forget whichever one has <laughs> beer, one does not. The one with beer, I gotta admit that extra level does make it higher. I would think, which I think is the uh, the other one. Birmingham uh, is the harder of the two as well. Yeah, I think that's the one that also includes having to have beer for your people, which is a little. Again, it steps up that learning curve. So I wouldn't right. say it's quite yeah, Bir- as surprisingly easy. Birmingham is the newer one at 2018. Uh, whereas Lancashire is the older, uh, the, the older, older, which original. there is an updated version of Lancashire too, because yeah. it was yeah, just sure. Brass and British Lancashire. So yeah, specifically Lancashire, though I do think it's true for Birmingham as well. I just think Lancashire you should almost play first before the other to for learning stuff. But you know what? They're close enough. Right. If you can only try one, why not try the better one? I personally own both, so I would introduce you to one than the other. Right. And that was Brass Lancashire or Brass Birmingham. All right, next one. I almost had Sean talk about this one, but we figured having him talk about one while I talked about the rest would feel out of place. And that is Pulsar 2849. Now, this is another one that setting it up scares people. This is an intimidating game. There's this huge round board with all these stars on it and different colored lines connecting them. And then a ridiculous number, honestly, like it's too many little sideboards that you stick at strange spots around it. They don't matter where they go. And it just, the board just kind of like Frankenstein's out. And then you cover most of these boards with tokens, chips and counters. And then there's a pile of dice you throw on and these blood drop things. And then there's this tech tree that just almost the size of the board branching off out of the top of the circle. Like it's just so much going on and i have a hard time fitting this well on my eight by four table than getting the players to sit around it and be able to reach everything like it's just one of those massively intimidating games but again this is one of those games where we've mentioned many times tonight that does something to make it more approachable which is limiting your options each turn like on this game you only get two turns two actions every turn most of the time there is a way to earn a third bonus action most of the time you're looking at only doing two things so that's one of the things what you're doing is going to be limited by the dice you have because only certain numbers can do certain actions and then another bonus is right at the start of the game a bunch of the actions require your ship i think it's called your ship your shuttle your whatever whatever the pieces you move around the board so i didn't double check the rules for these games tonight this is all going off the top of my head um whatever you, you move your little shuttlecraft around And you can't do a lot of the stuff unless you're on specific spots where you pass certain things. So like the first turn of the game, of your two actions, one's going to be move your ship. Like for everyone who plays the game, 99% of the time, your first turn is going to move the ship. So now you only have one action to worry about. Now I got to admit, the Pulsar almost dropped honorable mentions tonight. And that is the fact that to really get this game, it takes a lot of front loading. Because the first decision of the game is draft dice, and you're probably going to have the options of one through six, and you kind of need to know what all six of those options are. So I have to say what I actually recommend is skip that if you're teaching the game for the first time. Just let people draft whatever dice they want and then explain what options they have available that turn. And this is one of those games where you go to you don't have to finish. Like during your first learning game, maybe you play through turns one and two and restart. And that's probably a better way to onboard person to the people to this game instead of having to front load everything. But once that info is there, the actual decision points, like I said, it's such a small decision tree. It's I'm, I'm picking between uh, two actions, my turn. That's it. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, this game is terrifying for so many people, I'm sure, to see spread out on a table. Uh, but especially if you like the sci-fi theme, uh, it, it all becomes really obvious and, and it's just, okay, this is all I can do. So these are the only things I have to focus on. Okay. I've learned those. Now the next turn, when something else comes up, mm-hmm. I now know three things. And the next turn, maybe I know five things because I got two different things. Uh, and so, no, you're not going to end up learning, going through your first game and knowing all the possible scenarios and, and winning things. Uh, but that's okay. And things are going to change every game too, because there are some randomized things about the setup as well. So it's okay that you haven't learned everything because everyone's sort of playing it new unless they've managed to get it to the table 15 or 20 times. Uh, Definitely far easier than the setup of the game (laughs) would allow you to think. And that is Pulsar 2849. All right, next, I've got the Pathfinder Adventure card game. And this is one for me that I, I am one of the people who is intimidated by this game. Like the role-playing game it's based on, this game has a huge rulebook. Well, not as huge as the 900-page RPG rulebook, but this is the biggest board game rulebook out of every game I own. This is massive. That right there is going to scare some people away. 
the thing you have to realize, and it took me a bit to realize this myself, is that the Pathfinder Adventure card game is run at tournaments. And due to the fact there are tournaments with prizes where people can win cards, the rules have to be extremely detailed with every possible situation and card combination covered and timing of play and all the stuff you get from any tournament style game. Uh, I always like to compare it to Magic the Gathering when Sean and I first started playing back in the Unlimited rules compared to what the rules for Magic look like now with the very detailed timing and everything. And all of that's driven by um, organized play where they want everyone to play by the same rules, which makes sense. But most board games can leave some wiggle room for your personal group now this game scared me but then sitting down to actually play it actually plays really well and that huge rule book is actually a fantastic reference tool it's got a great index and it's great for looking up stuff during play we found it actually plays smoother than some other games we played yeah i think the the card games have that adva advantage of have being able to put rules right on that card Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, while yes, absolutely, there, there are these giant rule books and, and magic. I mean, it used to be stuck inside with the cards when we mm -hmm. first started playing uh, and, and it's grown. But again, once you understand that basic structure, so much of it can be loaded right onto those cards in front of you. And then if it gets a little tough, you've got the rule book to go to. Uh, and so for the, in this case, it, it's Pathfinder, the adventure card game. All right, next, I have Misery Farm, better known, or actually possibly better known as Misery Farm, uh, otherwise known as Agricola or Agricola, depending on who you ask, and I'll probably say it three different ways in this podcast alone. Uh, this is going to follow the same trend here by being a rather complex game with a lot of options that only presents you with a small subset of them at a time. This one, even more so than I think any of the others I played in this game, because when you start, you play through various seasons and it's a worker placement game, but only, I think it's like five slots are unlocked the first season. And then you randomly unlock two more. And then the next season you unlock three more and the next season you unlock two more until eventually they're all unlocked. So it, it very gradually builds on your potential options, which again, narrows that decision tree, which makes the game way simpler. Added to that is the fact that it is a worker placement game where if someone takes a spot, you can't take it. So depending on your position in play uh, order, the options you have are going to be even more limited. Now, with the base game, I'm, the caveat, this goes to the original printing, because that's what I own, is there is a family mode. And by playing with the family mode, it removes a set of two sets of random cards from the game. Now, what those random cards do is they add asymmetry, which is generally a good thing. But as far as onboarding and learning a game, it is perfectly fine to take those out. That way, everyone's on the same page with all the same options at all the same time. Now, nowadays, they have actually put out a family version of the game, which I know doesn't use the cards, but I think it also simplifies some of the worker placement spots. Again, I own the original print thing. I still have cubes for my animals instead of little animeeples. So I have to talk about the version of the game I have because I haven't played the others. Uh, but I was shocked by, like, to me, this is, I wouldn't call it a gateway game, but it is very much like a next step from your ticket to rides or Catans. It looks huge and intimidating. Uh, there is the misery factor. This is not a forgiving game uh you may make mistakes and you could end up with a negative score but as far as learning the mechanics of the game this has a great onboarding system by teaching you a little bit at a time yeah just because a game is hard doesn't mean it's not easy to teach and easier than it, it might appear yeah. it should be hard as a matter of fact you, you don't we don't want again we don't want the role of movies uh games as we were talking yes. about earlier you still want a solid game we're just looking for something that could terrify you at first glance, but actually isn't all that bad, even if you're never going to win. And that yeah, was when we, when I first wrote the, the topic of this, I had simple, surprisingly simple games. And I realized that had more connotations. Yeah. Like that's the, no, this game isn't easy. It's not even hard to just simple. You just roll dice or whatever. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we're not necessarily talking about easy to win games either. We're talking about just games that seem like intimidating, like, wow, there's no way I can learn to play this, where you're like, wow, this isn't bad at all. And that was Agricola, or Agricola, or however else you want to pronounce Misery Farm. Yes. All right, the 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 new hotness of the list tonight. I did have a classic on here. I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to it, but I'm not going to talk about it. I did have El Grande on this list, but I decided to throw out the old grizzled game, the old area control game, and throw on something shiny and new at the last minute. And that is based on some recent experience with this game, and that is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. 
Now, the reason I wanted to put this on the list is because I would never, ever include Gloomhaven itself on this list. If anything, that probably could have been on our list of surprisingly complex games. Because when you compare Gloomhaven to the other dungeon crawling style RPG games like the D&D Wrath of a Shardalon or, or your Imperial Assaults or your Descents, it is way heavier and way more complicated than those games. This is not a hack and slash dice chucker. This is a uh, hand management, um, action optimization, don't waste any possible time, work together or die kind of game which means there's no way, like this is going to scare the heck out of people, right? People are buying this, expecting this light game, and it's not. But now you have Jaws of the Lion. This is a standalone game in the Gloomhaven universe that is meant to be the new entry point to the system. And it is. It is a fantastic gateway to Gloomhaven. It does an amazing job of onboarding new players by very slowly and deliberately presenting new rules and mechanics through a series of five tutorials at the beginning of the campaign. It is such a better entry point that I'm like frustrated we didn't have this when we started playing. And, and everyone else who's just getting into it, like say thank you to Isaac for creating this because it's so much better. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Gloomhaven is uh, shockingly hard. I think so many people expect, uh, you know, an RPG dungeon crawler um yeah. and it is not um i i think a lot of people have jumped in pro and, and discovered this uh maybe if they haven't had the investment of the board game jumping into the beta on steam for the mm -hmm. video game uh you really sort of learn quickly that no this isn't you don't just walk into a dungeon no no the card management aspect of this game is uh bordering on cruel <laughs> and the fact that jaws of the lion has gone out of their way to just walk you through and mm -hmm. teach you in baby steps that are still enjoyable and, and not True. easy, but still, you know, meaty enough to keep your attention uh, is just amazing. And, and, and an absolute, you know, if you're, if you are interested in what they've done with gloom, that's where to go. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, there's nowhere else to go. And that was Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. All right, up next, I'm going to mention a name that immediately is going to put fear into some casual gamers, and that is Steffenfeld. That is a designer who immediately has connotations uh, attached to his name. This is a designer who is famous for point salad games with tons of options and ridiculous number of decision points where everything you do might earn you some points, but figuring out the right thing to do is always the difficult decision. Well, Strasbourg for me is the exception to the rule. The 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 Steffenfeld game that that doesn't isn't as much a point salad. That isn't a huge decision tree. Now, while no means a light game, again, Strasbourg is the most easy to approach of all the Steffenfeld games I think out there. Carpe Diem, you could probably argue uh, for 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 similarly, but there's still more to think about in Carpe Diem than there is in Strasbourg. Now, the game itself is just a bunch of auctions using a closed economy that all leads to a mix. And here's where the Feld gets in and where you have area majority, area control, set collection and pattern making. So you still have a bit of a point salad there, but it's all about these auctions and winning these auctions and knowing when to bid all with a closed economy where everyone's using the same set of cards to make their bids. Now, well, again, similar to other games we mentioned tonight, this may take multiple plays to master the game. Getting the basics down, literally you'll have by the first, like after the first auction and you play through a lot of auctions, you're going to get it. Like we're going to do the first auction and be like, oh, I came in first, so I get this. And you came in second, so you get that. And you came in third, so you get this. And I came in fourth, so I get nothing. Okay, I get it. Next auction. Yeah, okay, I got it. Let's go. Let's play Strasbourg. Now, again, uh, the other great part about this game is it's quick for Feld. It's like lightning click, like an hour. And I, I honestly think if you play this and teach someone, play twice because you're going to have time to do it on an average game night, and it's well worth it. This is a fantastic game. Uh, it highlights just how diverse Feld can be in his games. Interesting. I See, I haven't played Strasbourg yet, uh, but I have played Carpe Diem online. Yeah. Uh, and one thing we, we've talked about many times on this game is how hard it is to learn to play something online. And I yeah. didn't do the video watch before jumping into Strasbourg. This is when we were testing some of the other um, non board game arena mm -hmm. sites. Uh, and I found Carpe Diem really easy. So to think Strasbourg is easier is, is, is shocking, I guess. Uh, it, it's know. the 
end game scoring tiles that you have to plan ahead for in Carpe Diem that I think make it that step above. Okay. No matter how every round you're going to score one of them, it's right. that strategy of having to plan ahead and not realizing how limited those are going to be. And so you start building buildings because they're based on your frame and then you totally skip that aspect, you're just going to lose badly. It's that aspect that I think makes Carpe Diem just a little bit higher. Now, I would say in general, this goes back to our picking which games to play in our teaching episodes. I would go for theme. What do people prefer, auctions or tile lane? If they're like, oh, I'm a huge Carcassonne fan, I'll probably teach them Carpe Diem. Whereas if they're like, oh, I love Raw, then I'd be like, oh, I'll show you Strasbourg. All right, well, that was Strasbourg from Stefan Feld. All right, I did have to keep a couple older crusty games on this list because uh, there's some great examples. And this is a longtime favorite of mine, Power Grid. For many years, this was my number one game. It's still up there. I still love this game. And back when I got into hobby gaming, this was considered to be one of the most intimidating and heavy, at least heavy seeming games. Like this was the big bad boy people broke out. They're like, oh, we're going to play some Power Grid. Like you look at the map on this and it's like risk with all these connections. Like you get this huge map of either Germany or the US. You got all these pipes everywhere with numbers on the pipes and there's prices everywhere. And then there's this huge resource market at the bottom with four different types of wooden goods and, oh, and stuff on the bottom. And you're like, wow, I there is a lot going on. And then you've got the power plants and, and the winner is however builds many plants, but only the ones that are powered. But then again, this game does a lot to slowly ramp up. For one, the starting power grid, the starting power plant market is limited. Now, just the first time, but there is a rule where the most expensive plant keeps dropping out of the price out of the market at the end of every round. And it tries to keep the prices low. And plus, these plants aren't very good. So you can't just suddenly build a bunch of power plants, or sorry, a bunch of this is the part in Power Grid I always get confused for. There's, I can't remember what the buildings on the board are compared to the power plants in front of you. You can't build a lot of buildings on the board because you won't be able to power them because your power plants aren't good enough. And that's by design that you won't be able to get the big ones. Plus, at the start of the game, you don't have any money. So you're never going to do like this huge, I'm going to go through these three routes and build way over there. You'll never be able to afford it. So you're limited to the stuff that's really close to the start of the board in your starting position, pro probably only building one new connection every turn. Where is that seventh round or 14th round when everyone's got seven houses and you do the round where you put out five different houses and you figure out how to cut someone off and it's so different from the beginning of the game. And then there's the one additional rule where you can only build one power plant in every city, which is again going to limit the amount of your options and, and being able to cut people off and things like that. This is really a true engine builder, right? Then that's, that's engine builders in general are great at this because it's only once you get going that all the options become available. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, a power grid is one of those ones that intimidates me nearly by its name and, and the, <laughs> the sort of uh, hidden mystery behind the, oh my God, it's power grid. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, 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 and it's one of those things that, and uh, while well, no, I, I know for a fact that the other, the other one that feels like that is in some ways, and that's food chain magnet, um, yeah, no. which, which actually is uh, that hard, at least it, by, uh, by its ranking levels. But those are, those are two games where, uh, and they, they are really comparable because food chain magnet is actually a crazy difficult game where mm -hmm. you can lose the game in the first turn yes. versus power grid, which has this ramping up, ability to it uh but they both sort of have that same mystique about them where they intimidate players uh one rightly and one wrongly and the one so that one is power grid all right finally we're going to get talking about intimidations and games that scare people I, I had to include at least one of these on here and that is a train game uh there there was a time where if you just said i want to play a train game or oh you're a train game there was a connotation to that now this has changed a bit because there's a, now a very solid gateway train game ticket to ride that almost everyone knows so nowadays when you say train game most people think ticket to ride but there was a time before ticket to ride where train game meant these heavy crayon rail games or 18xx style stock market games now, Steam is the game I'm throwing on the list. This is Steam Rails to Riches specifically, or the, the new printing of it that was kickstarted. I think it's still called Rails to Riches. Specifically, not Age of Steam or Railways of the World or the other variants. Just Steam from uh, Merton Wallace. This is a game that, to me, sits right in the middle. It, it's the, uh, the... It's not 
ticket to ride simple just it's rummy with trains and it's not an 18xx with a million things to worry about it's rope building with having much fewer options than an 18xx game plus you only control your train route which is a huge thing compared to the stock market games you're not buying companies and selling kind you're just worried about your own set of tracks and your own connections trying to deliver cubes from the other cities you connect to to other cities that you connect to now i obviously wouldn't consider steam a gateway game but i think it's a great stepping stone to heavier train games as well as just being a solid rail system on its own now there are two sets of rules that are included in steam there is rules for an auction and if you want this to be the simple teach you ditch that now that's the auction system is from the age of steam series of games which is why i'm saying go with steam not age of steam because it removes that now player orders just randomized and you pick a roll at the start of the turn that gives you a bonus instead of having to auction money because it's so hard to value those auctions if you don't know the game so toss out the auction rules which are optional so i'm not like saying modify the game toss out the optional auction rules play steam as written it is still to this day my favorite train game just because of how accessible it is it gives me that heavy train game feel without the intimidation and brain burn and six to seven hour gameplay time of an 18xx yeah i mean route building train games are not something that interests me uh and so if you if you if you say hey i've got a martin wallace game for me yeah i may or may not have interest but it's good to know that there are these options that for the people who do like that kind of game can get into this heavier side of the game uh, rather than a ticket to ride and, and get there with ease, right? Mm -hmm. Without being completely overwhelmed and spending the next 12 hours of your life locked into a room with people playing 18xx. And for that option, you've got Steam. All right, I've got, that was 12 games tonight uh, that we have featured today, which I think had a pretty broad range of games as well as difficulties in that. But I do have three honorable mentions. These are games that I think are surprisingly easy, but have something that made me keep them off this list. So the first one is going to be Concordia. I was really tempted to put this on this list when doing research for this episode tonight and looking what other people have on lists like this. Concordia was on almost every one. Like, it's a pretty simple game. It looks intimidating. It's a trading in the Mediterranean game. You start off at Rome, you spread out, you're getting resources, building cities, you're traveling over the Mediterranean Sea, all kinds of stuff. But each turn is really simple. You have a bunch of cards you play, pick one card from your hand and you do what it says on the card. And that's it. And each individual card in action is pretty simple. One's like move your guy and build a building or trade goods at a spot or build a new port, right? It's pretty simple. The problem with this game is the scoring. The scoring in Concordia was so opaque that the rules actually suggest that you stop your first game halfway through, hold a special scoring round so that all the players are on the same page before you get to the end of the game so no one's frustrated by how poorly they did because they didn't understand it. Like, I have seen people think they are doing fantastic and they got stuff all over the board and they got their handful of cards and they're like, this is awesome. And then they come in last place and just get frustrated because they totally didn't understand what the actual goal of the game was. So they were doing things, but it wasn't towards the right targets. And that's why I don't think Concordia quite makes this list, though I do have to say it's easier than it looks. Just watch out for that scoring. Yeah, it's interesting. Concordia is actually uh, ranked easier than many, if not all, of the games we've already mentioned. Yeah. But that one little twist can just ruin your night if, <laughs> if not handled and, and learned properly. And that is Concordia. All right, next. I know our chat room's already brought this one up tonight. That is Tale to Walk in City of the Gods. Now, again, the rules aren't hard. The mechanics aren't hard. And yes, this fits the intimidates the hell out of people with the massive board and all kinds of stuff on it and dice and a pyramid and, and painting tiles and all these different action spots. And you start playing and you're like, this isn't bad at all. I just moved my dice. It's just a giant rondelle. Wow, this is it. This is a rondelle. And I move and I collect my resources to do the things. Here's the few things that get us points. No problem. Should be on this list for that reason. But... Tencordia is one of the fiddliest games in my collection. There are so many things that trigger off of other things that are easy to, to walk forget. In, not Concordia. Sorry, I said <laughs> Concordia's. 
I don't even know where I, that's, I, you know, I'm off script when I'm not even looking. <laughs> um, so yes, there are so many things in Teotihuacan that, that what keeps it off this list is the fiddliness because almost like everything you do triggers something else. So you go to the building spot and when you build something, you're going to put a tile on the thing. And when you put a tile on the thing, you're going to match up the symbols. And if the symbols match up, you're going to go up on the God track. Well, when you go up on the God track, it's going to give you an extra action. It's going to give you a brick. And when you get a brick, you're going to look over to your technology tree and go, well, I'm using action number six. And when I use action number six, I get a free coin. And then when I get a free coin, I'm going to go over and it's going to put me up on this other track. And I'm just making this up. Like if you played Teotihuacan, you know, I'm not quite talking about actual progression there, but it's like that. There's, there's always this one thing that triggers the God track, which can trigger the other thing, which can trigger the other God track, which can trigger the path of the dead. And every time I play this game, someone forgets something. And it's one of those where it's like three turns later and it's like, oh, I forgot to take my cocoa for going here. Or, oh, I forgot I had this technology. So when I was over here and got gold, I should have actually gotten extra gold. And that happens every game. This is one of the few board games where I honestly think it's better in a digital adaptation because of all these little things that are so easy to miss. And that is what's keeping it off this list. Because overall, the mechanics are so much simpler than the game would imply, but it's those chain reactions that are so easily forgotten that keeps it off the list for tonight. Yeah, we definitely need to, uh, well, I need to sit down and watch a Let's Play, and then we need to start up a table at BGA because uh, it's a terrifying game to look at set up. Uh, yeah. It's just just horrifying to see that on a table spread out going, where do you even start? Yeah. But again, it, you know, especially with BGA where it can track everything for you. Mm -hmm. um, definitely something that's uh, more approachable in that way. So the digital ver uh, version should be on our main list. But because of the fiddliness, it only gets an honorable mention. And that is Teotihuacan. All right, my final game for tonight is going to be Keyflower. This is another one that's going to scare people whenever I bring it out. There's no doubt about that. Uh, just you got different colored meeple behind your screens and trying to value the different tiles. And then the explanation that some tiles don't actually do anything unless you set up an engine to use them. And like this is only worth points once you deliver goods to it and how you upgrade things. Like there's a lot going on. Now, once you start playing, though, I find people pick this up really quickly and it's not as bad. And people love the ability to use other people's boards like that's just such a neat mechanic that you're building your own thing. But you can you're, when you can use your opponent's stuff. It's just a neat way, neat thing to see in a game like this. But there are two things for me that keep Keyflower off the main list. And the first is how bidding and outbidding other players works with the meeples, especially the ones placed on the tiles. People tend to get the auction on the outside of the tile, but when you place them on and you always have to place more meeple than the previous person and then there's a max that you can bid, that, that catches people up every time. The second is the fact that in the first round of the game, you are handed winter tiles and you have to decide which ones you keep. Well, these winter tiles are end game scoring. Well, to properly pick a winter tile, you have to kind of know the entire game and how it works before you can make a good decision. So yes, you could just sit down and go, you know what, just pick one, we'll just play. But this isn't one of those, we play it quickly, let's play twice in a night kind of games. This is a heavier brain burning game. You're probably not going to want to play that second game. And it's also not like other games where I say, just play a couple rounds and start over because these winter tiles don't come effect until the last round of the game. So it's those two things that has me not place Keyflower on the list. Though overall, it's way simpler than it looks for intimidation factor, but just those two elements keep it off this list. And yet another one that is on Board Game Arena that we really probably ought to... Uh, is it? Yeah, it is. Oh. I, I actually hadn't been aware it was, but I, I did a quick check and it is there. So oh, that's uh, a good one. Something else we need to... Uh, we, we need to up our, uh, our, our Board Game Arena plays, uh, apparently. Uh, and that is Keyflower. Now, there are some... You have, have some of the best games that were actually easier to play than we expected. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has anything to add. So there's been a bunch of chatter going on. Uh, Ryan suggest, expected Dungeon Lords to get a mention tonight. Oh, uh, that, that, would, that would be no. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. 
Dungeon Lords does not. That was on the other list. Dungeon Lords was on our games that are way more complicated than they look like they're going to be. There were, I will admit, there were a lot of games that could have been on the list tonight. There, I, I could have easily done top 25. It's just the last time we did one of these, we had 25 episodes, we went over time. So I decided to cut it down <laughs> to 12 nominations and three, uh, three honorable mentions, but I definitely could have done some more. Yeah, and uh, Daniel, uh, one of the Daniels, is mentioning... Uh... Uh, for Feld, Notre Dame is easier than they expected. No, I agree. Notre Dame was I'm, on my short list. It was one I was definitely considering. In um, excuse me, in the Year of the Dragon is another I think Feld that is surprisingly easy. Um, uh, what was the other one? I had another Feld. Is it Feld? Maybe it's not Feld. I am drawing a blank. I can <laughs> picture the board. I can't even remember if this game's a Stephen Feld or not. Let alone the name of the game. So now I'm totally <laughs> off somewhere. Oh, what's the name of that? Wow, I'm drawing a blank. All right, if I think of it, I'll bring it up. <laughs> but yeah, in general, Stefan Feld's like, I saw Trajan on someone's list, and I'm like, how hard did you think it would be? Because my <laughs> God, that game is hard to teach. That is not an easy to teach right. game. I hate teaching Trajan. I love the game, um, but I'm like, I don't see how that could be simpler than anyone expected. Like, you, you must have expected absolutely <laughs> horrible. Um, Vinhos Deluxe was another one I almost put on here. And Vinhos Deluxe gets the nod because the actions you take make sense to the theme. And that's where it's easier to learn than you'd expect. Cause you're like, you're going to a wine tasting. So of course you want to hire a taster before you go. And you well, assuming you know something the... about wine. I'm sure there's plenty oh, yeah, of people. So, yeah, but even, <laughs> it, even if you have the, the, the cursory, if you think it's the kind of thing you'd want at a wine festival, it's probably in the game, right? Like you don't have to actually know. Uh, and uh uh, Pennywise he's, no, mentions uh, he prefers Brass Birmingham uh, as being more fun and agrees with uh, both Zolkin, Teotihuacan, and Pulsar. There and, you go. And Josh Lyons. So we're, and we're, Lyons. Hitting, so we're, we're on the same there page on, there. on the same page with Daniel. Now, Ryan mentions uh, he finds it difficult to gauge whether a game is actually easier than it seems. And I agree that this is a, a sort of a, a tough and, and ethereal concept. Mm. Um, I think one of the good... Uh, judgments is, uh, and and I agree, this is going to be a little more tough for you, Ryan. I, I apologize, but how it looks uh, on the box and on the table, you know, how a game uh, looks and, and the, the spread, and the intimidation factor is a big, big thing. Uh, if you look at something like Gloomhaven, for example, it's a uh, hex grid, dungeon tiles, a few monsters, and some cards. It really doesn't look that difficult. It looks like your standard RPG uh, hack and slash until you look at those cards and understand mm -hmm. the, the the resource management and the, the the extreme limits involved, and it ramps up. Whereas if you look at something like um, Teotihuacan, it's got this huge, terrifying uh, you know setup out there in front of you. And there's so many little fiddly bits that, that you, you know, where do you start? Uh, and a lot of it, I think, is going to depend on your teacher, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not if you're if you're just sitting down with that first um, with that first play and you don't have a teacher, you're just sitting there with a, an open box in front of you and a, and a rule book. Uh, they can be terrifying until you realize that they've got these easy build up mechanics or whatever it is that got them onto this list uh, that just made it that much easier to start playing and start enjoying. And that's actually mm -hmm. one of the big things I find is you can play a game and muddle through it, but you got to get to that point where you're playing it and enjoying it. Even if you're not doing well, mm -hmm. you can be enjoying the fact that you're playing it and not stressing out at how terrifyingly difficult everything is the first time through. Sleepy uh. falling asleep on us. <laughs> All right. Um, not I'm still saying. trying to remember the name of that one game, and I'm drawing <laughs> a complete blank, like complete and total. I see a lot of people say say uh, Mage Knight, but I did not find that. I found that way pain in the butt to learn. And I see people like Indonesia. No, the merging rules are horrible. But yeah, it's definitely subjective, right? This goes along with Roger's topic of a couple weeks ago on how much your your play experience affects your the, the weight of the games. Hansa Teutonica, that was the name of the game I was trying to think of. Hansa I had Teutonica. it on the list and I there deleted it. That's a Feld too, isn't it? Uh, I think so. 
That's the other, it, assuming it's a feld, that's the other <laughs> feld that I find is way easier. No, it's not. Okay. I was okay. like, maybe it's not. No, it's Andrea <laughs> Stedding. But it's a Euro that's just like way simpler than it looks like it's going to be. But then once you see the, the difficulty and the backstabbing, it gets way better game. But that's another like plays in like an, an hour and a lot like that's that's my my ticket to ride euro if you want a euro feeling ticket to ride because you're route building between these german guilds and you're just putting cubes out instead of trains but that is a, a really good one that was on the list and i took it off because it was just it's out of print for one so i, I sometimes i hate recommending <laughs> like games no one can actually Can't recommend buy. all the games that don't no uh yeah that's <laughs> no the other reason like oh grande is still in print but most of the, some of the ones i took off the list tonight were a little too hard to find, I thought. For including. well, I mean, even your version of Agricola, Agricola. Well, yeah, you can't get that. But like, I I know the new version has at least some aspects, and like I said, plus there's the family version, which I have to assume makes it even simpler somehow. Mm. All right. Okay, let's. Mm. Uh, jet set is more difficult than it is. I don't know jet set. Uh, your Vic is pretty simple. Yeah, that's a Feld that's pretty simple. Well, I know it has speaker stat, but yeah. speaker stat is pretty simple. Uh, da, da. yeah, <laughs> Brian, what game are you trying to remember? That didn't help. Looks can be deceiving. Um, I don't like in a way, some of it I think is subjective. So, Jet, so, jet Set's a, a route building, uh, playing game, card drafting, route building, uh, okay, airplane game. So, it's ticket to ride with airplanes. So, what I, what I think we should do, and I think this is actually going to happen, is what I think I want to do is I want to dive into this more next week. So when we get to our philosophical topic, I think I want to talk about what makes games easier, All what right. what designers can do to make games easier, which we, we can really highlight Jaws of the Lion as an example, mm -hmm. but just things like onboarding, limiting decisions. Um, I actually almost threw that in as part of the discussion before the main topic today, but then Deanna pointed out that's probably a standalone topic and long enough right. that it's going to take us half an episode to talk about before. So I'm like, all right, we'll break it off. So that may, that, that may be what we do next week is dive into dive into what what designers can do and not what games do it well because we've already done that but what makes these games right. easier than we expect them to be sounds good finally if you've got a game or game night question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or email me questions at tabletopbellhop.com Today, we're going to take a look at Orléans Trade and Intrigue, an expansion for the bag-building Euro game Orléans. A big thank you to Tasty Minstrel Games for providing us with a review copy of this expansion. Right, the Trade and Intrigue expansion for Orléans was designed by Rainer Stockhausen, which is the designer of the original game. Features art by Clemens Franz, again, matching the original game. It was published in 2016 by Tasty Minstrel Games and was nominated for the Golden Geek Best Board Game Expansion Award that year. Now, this is the second expansion for Orléans, and to use this expansion, you do need to have Orléans, but you don't need to have the first expansion, which was Invasion. So for a good look at what comes in this expansion for Orléans, be sure to check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Now, one notable thing about this expansion right off the bat is the box. Orléans Trade and Incre comes in a rather thin box, and I mean thin by a couple of ways. Because for one, it's just like two or three punch boards thick, like it's a quarter of an inch thick. Plus, it's very thin cardboard itself. Like it's, it's, it's a... Not what you call a board game box. It's the kind of box you get stuff in, right? Uh, what this means is it's pretty much a disposable box. Now, the contents of this box are meant to be punched out and put with the main game, not kept in this box. So now, oh, yep. now inside this disposable box, you will find some punch boards. Uh, you got 34 new event tiles, three new place tiles, and 10 cover tiles used to cover up spots on the new boards when playing with less than four players. Uh, there are two double-sided new boards and a deck of 23 order cards. And then finally, you have a fold-out uh, rule book that's three panels, six, if you count both sides, six pages. So while I personally love the ability to fit expansions into the main box and get rid of all that extra cruft, I know there are some folks out there who mm -hmm. love to keep things in their place. And this style of board game expansion might bug those folk. Yeah, which is why I thought it was worth bringing it up because it is going to bother. I and mean, you can't fit this box in the original box either. It's not quite small enough. 
Now, the trade and intrigue expansion for Orléans adds four new optional rule modules. I would almost say five because there are also three new play styles to go with the base game. And I'm going to take a look at each of these in detail, starting with the play styles. So you get two new level one places, one new level two places. Uh, level one, there's the Brasserie, which provides wine and cheese. There's the Merchant House, which awards points at the end of the game for collecting the most of the five different types of goods. Now, at level two, you have a Sheep Farm, which is going to let players convert the cheese good into their choice of wool, money, or progress on the development track. So nothing too outlandish here. These feet fit in nicely with what I recall being in the original game and should just be a comfortable fit for all players. Totally agree. Now, the Orders expansion adds a pickup and deliver element to Orléans, something totally new in the game. Five order cards are displayed at the top of the board. Each shows one of the cities located in the board and a number of goods that that city wants and a number of victory points for delivering those goods. During a player's turn, if they're merchants at one of the cities and they're able to discard the goods shown on the card, they can claim it. They then score the points on the card at the end of the game. Again, this is, while while new, it does fit the game rather nicely and just seems like a natural extension mm -hmm. of the base game. Next, we have the new events. Now, for this one, you are tossing out the current event deck and replacing it with a completely new one. Now, this new one, unlike the original one, has the tiles broken into four sets labeled A, B, C, D. And each game, you're going to randomly use four out of each set, which means you're not always, you're not always going to know what's in the deck each time. Now, these do all kinds of different things, either giving players new options or limiting their options for that round. Overall, they're more varied, and the way the deck is stacked makes it so that events come out in a less random order, with the especially punishing events only happening near the end of the game where players can afford the punishment. So this is a full replacement, but not something really you need to relearn if you, unless you've played enough and are so used to the originals that you're expecting them and, and planning for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the easiest modules to use is the new Beneficial Deeds board. All you do is leave the original board in the box and put the new one out instead. This new Beneficial Deeds board provides a wider variety of in-game rewards for promoting your workers using the Town Hall action as well as some of the play styles. In the original game, all you ever got for promoting was a bit of extra money and the potential to gain citizens if you complete one of the tracks. This new board has changed that so you get a wealth of new options. Now I'm not going to go into each different possible spot on the board. I do do that on the written version of the review, but we'll, what I will say here is there are a lot of variety with spaces that give trade goods, that let you move your merchant more easily, give you access to building place tiles and technology tiles. Overall, just a lot more than just getting a couple bucks and some new citizens. Yeah, this one can be a bigger game changer than some of the earlier ones. It opens up whole new strategy potentials uh, based on how you use this board compared to just getting some cash and people. Yep. Now, the entry board is similar. It's equally easy to, to add. You're doing the same thing. What you do is you toss out the original beneficial deeds board and put out this new intrigue board. This is similar to the Beneficial Deeds board, except all of the things you do here don't really give you more things. Rather, they pretty much punish your opponents. Like this adds a player versus player backstabbing element to Orleans. Now, again, I'm not going to go into detail of each spot on the board. There are a lot, but some of them include things like fraud, which lets you swap goods with an opponent, say trading in your grain for their cloth arsonist that lets you burn down an opponent's trading house or the hangman which lets you kill a random follower from your opponent uh and the spy which lets you steal technology tiles from their board and put it on yours now one interesting thing they did add with the uh intrigue board is the ability to bribe your opponents when you're about to do something nasty to someone else they can bribe you with coins or goods and if you accept then the action doesn't go through yeah now this one i'm not sure I'm not the sort who loves backstabby games. Uh, I don't even generally play PvP <laughs> video games. So yeah. this one's really kind of not for me. I'd all start with to talk about this, this overall is that I am very glad that the rules are optional and modular because there are some things here I love, uh, some things that are okay, and something I don't plan on ever using again. Now, again, I'll go through my thoughts on each of these. Uh, first up, the new buildings. They're fine. Toss them in, use them, forget about them. They're there from now on. Sure, there's new buildings. Yeah, this that one's just a complete no-brainer. 
Yeah. Now the orders. Uh, this one, I've gotten mixed reviews from the people I played with. Uh, for example, Deanna is not a fan of these new rules at all. Personally, I like them. I thought adding pick up and deliver to this was cool. I had no problem with that. There were more reasons to move my guy around the board and it greatly changes the value of the good tiles. And I thought that was a good thing because in the original game, good tiles are just points. Whereas now I can use them for other things, but there's a problem with the order uh, cards and that's finding the cities on the boards. Now, anyone who's played ticket to ride is going to recognize this. This is way worse than this game. The font used on the board for the city names is tiny and it's written in script. That's not easy to read. I it gets, honestly, I cannot see anyone be able to read this from across the table. You basically have to lean over to the board to be able to read them. Now, I do know a friend who actually went and hand-printed new city names and stuck them on their board so they're nice and visual, which is cool. And I admit, I'm tempted to do the same to use this module a little more often. But that's not something I should have to do, modify my game to make this work. As for orders, I don't know. I could take it or leave it. Like, I like it, but I'm fine with not using it if someone at the table doesn't like it. Yeah, even with good eyes so that the size doesn't matter, the typeface choice is absolutely problematic. It may also become a familiarity issue. If you've played enough, some people may just know where the cities are. Mm, true. Uh, another option could be a small uh, cheat sheet by your, you know, that you, you have on your side. So you can just glance at that and, and, and map that to the, to the board. Yeah, the design of the cards could have been better too because they just show a picture of the city or if they showed a map with the city highlighted or something, right? It's just yeah. some poor design choices went into that. Now we go to the new events. I love these. These are fantastic. Well, there's something to be said for the original game because it was perfect information. You always had the same events. You knew they were going to come up. You knew if you hadn't seen tax yet, it was going to happen by the, by the end of the game. Now, there is something to be said for that, but I had way more fun playing with the randomness and variety of the new events. Even more importantly, I appreciate the fact the deck is now stacked and timed with that ABCD so that different things happen in different parts of the game. So no longer do you start off the game and get taxed and you haven't collected any goods, so no one pays anything. Or you get money for progress on tracks that you couldn't have possibly gone up on yet. That was just a little too common for me in the original game. Of all the elements, including trade and intrigue, this is the one thing I will use every game. Like I have literally taken my original ones out and put them in a separate little plastic baggie that I don't plan to ever open again. Yeah, I look forward to seeing these on the table myself to get the feel, but they certainly sound more well-balanced and, and enjoyable. Now, the other aspect I plan to use pretty much every game I ever play going forward is going to be the new Beneficial Deeds board. I think this board is a huge improvement over the original. The rewards on the old board just weren't interesting or useful. Like, it was just a bit of money. Like, it just wasn't cool. Like, eh, I got some money. Maybe I got a citizen. Yeah, the citizens are important. You want citizens. Your end score is you add up your trading houses plus your citizens and times by your um, how far you are on the uh, discovery track. So you need them. It's a multiplier. But other than that, like, ooh, I got some coins. I, now you have all these new ways to do stuff. You have new ways to move up the development board. You have another way to get place tiles that doesn't involve having to buy um, traders. You have ways to get technology tiles that don't require you to build craftsmen. Uh, you've got another way to get goods, which is another nice upgrade, especially if you're using that orders module so you can get the goods you need to deliver. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thumbs up for this component, 100%. Now, finally, we get to the Intrigue board. I, straight up, I don't like it. I didn't like it at all. I didn't enjoy using this board. Well, it does greatly increase the interaction because a lot of people have complained Orleans Multiplayer Solitaire, and this is a direct effort by the designer to address that. This isn't the kind of interaction I find fun. The types of actions you can take on this board are just mean and overly punishing. I don't enjoy it in any game, a strategy game where I can plan out my move two moves ahead and I carefully plan out the strategy to get exactly the resources I need. I'm ready to carry it out. I got the right pull from my bag. And then another player uses this take cat action and ruins all my work. And that is pretty much what every one of these actions on that intrigue board feels like. It's just punching you down. Now, I know there's going to be groups out there that like this style of play. Like, I know a local group that I would bet good money will not play Orleans without using this board because that's the kind of play they like. They like in-your-face interaction. But it's not something I've enjoyed, and neither have any of the other players I've tried using this board with. Like, at this point, I don't plan on ever using this board ever again. 
Yeah. Now, interestingly, we had actually been warned about this board by some local players, and they were right. It's just not the style of game we enjoy. No, not at all. Sorry, designer, not for me. Overall, though, I got to say, Orléans Trade and Intrigue is very much worth picking up for fans of Orléans. Like, come on, this box came with five things, right? Five things. Two of them, I don't mind at all. Like, I actually like them. I'm not negative towards them at all. I'll use them, take them, or leave them. If other people don't want me to use them, that's fine. Two more modules I am going to use every time I play going forward. And then there's one module I didn't like. You know what? That's pretty good odds to me. And even the module I didn't like, I can see how some groups would enjoy that. And if that's your thing, if you like stabbing each other in the back, intrigue, you're going to love. And then you leave that beneficial deeds board that's just everyone getting free stuff. Well, for a more in-depth look at the trade and intrigue expansion for Orléans, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now we take a look at Flick Wars, a strategic and tactical dexterity-based war game. One note before we start, Andrew Tolson did provide us with a review copy of the retail version of Flick Wars. It's also worth noting in uh, the effort of full disclosure that I kind of have a long-term relationship with Andrew at this point. Not that I'm constantly in contact with him or he's a personal friend, but this is actually the third time I've looked at Flick Wars. Initially, I took a look at a prototype version way back in 2014, back when I used to write on the Windsor Gaming Resource blog, when he first tried to kickstart the game. And I have to admit, he failed at didn't fit, uh, succeed at funding at the time which a big part of that was games in 2014 on kickstarter just wasn't as big a thing but i do think there were some improvements later i reviewed the print and play version which is currently for sale on game crafter you can go buy a copy of the print and play version of flick wars and now i'm back again with flick wars but this time looking at the retail version uh this was created after a later and much more successful kickstarter so just to note that the board game geek page for this game is a bit of a mashup. Yeah. You're going to find pictures of basically every version all jammed onto the 2019 editions page. Yeah, I was having difficulty even trying to tell them, like looking at pictures, I'm like, whoa, that's from the other edition I had. So it is a little confusing. Um, on the blog, all the pictures I will be sharing will be of the retail version. So the retail version of Flick Wars was designed by Sean Astin and Andrew Tolson, features art from Sean Astin and Peter Walken, was successfully kickstarted in 2017, but due to production delays was not officially published until 2019 by Breaking Games. Flick Wars plays one to six players with games taking, I don't know, it totally depends on how many people you have and how good they are at flicking discs over uneven surfaces. I've had half hour games and I've had two hour games. It's definitely not a long one. This is not an epic, you know, Twilight Imperium kind of game, but it is very much going to depend on your skill level and the number of people playing. Yeah, for a look at what caused some of those delays, you can check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Yeah, this is not your usual board game box. I had a hard time filming this one just because of the setup I used for unboxing because this, due to this being a dexterity game, it's got some unusual components for a board game. Like for one, the box size is weird. It's a huge long box. Uh, people live can probably see it behind me here. Um, it is a size I've got to admit I hate. Like, I don't know. I still don't know where this is going to go in my basement, in my game room. There is not a good spot to fit this on there now the reason the box is so big is because this version of flick wars one of the major features is a neoprene battle mat for fighting your battles over now this mat's 24 inches by 30 inches and the box is made so you can roll up the mat and fit it without folding now i gotta say this is one dang nice mat like it really is it has this like really nice looking kind of sci-fi planet looking terrain that looks just sci-fi enough and once you get the 3d contours it just looks really cool and this is the kind of mat that i plan on stealing to use in other games that could be improved by having a battle mat um if you watch our gloomhaven live streams we might start using this as a backdrop if it doesn't throw off the colors too much because this is a one nice mat well it's nice Nice touch that you can roll and not fold the mat in that box. I do wonder if it is worth the hassle of this ungainly box. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a toughie, to be honest. It really is. Now, getting to the actual game. So you're going to start a game of Flick Wars. Um, 
you're going to pick a faction. There are six different factions. They're all unique, all asymmetric. Uh, you're going to have a different number of units, at least three different unit types. Some of the armies have four different unit types. Each unit type has unique abilities. Uh, just as a quick example, the purple faction are your StarCraft Zerg, right? It's a lot of low-cost units that are quick to deploy, but have very short attack ranges. Whereas the red factions are these big, massive mechs that are very expensive, but can move really quickly and have long range. That's just two of the six, and all the rest are kind of in between those two. Players are going to take their faction's deck of cards, and what they're going to do is each deck has multiple units for each unit type, so multiple cards. So you're going to pick one card to represent each of your unit types. Now, this card is going to give you the unit cost, the range it can attack from, and any special abilities. Uh, there's also, as I talking about our earlier topic today of onboarding and making games more approachable, every deck also includes two basic cards, which is meant to be used the first time you play, which are low cost, really simple. They don't have any special abilities on them. So nothing out of the ordinary, really, for anyone who's played miniature games, yep. miniature war games. Yeah, that's exactly what this basically is, is a skirmish war game. Because after you build your armies, you decide the player order. You're going to set up your HQs on the edge of the map. Uh, these are kind of cardboard. You fold them over and they tuck in. It, it looks cool enough. Uh, the exact layout is based on the number of players. Uh, like for three players, one person starts two inches on one side, another player is two inches on another, and the third player is in the middle of the side, and it actually makes a nice triangle. Uh, once everyone's placed their HQs, players are going to uh, now play scenery. Now, scenery is done using these wooden half spheres. These can be placed either on or under the map. This continues around the table until all six of these scenery discs are, are placed. What's really cool is the placing under. This is one of the brilliant things in this game. By placing these under a neoprene mat, you end up creating this 3D battlefield filled with hills and valleys. This is something I've never seen in a flicking game before. Now, note, uh, the rules do say you can use anything. It just happens to come with these wooden half circles. Like, you can use stuff that happens to be around your game room. I remember putting some wooden bowls under my play mat and throwing, like, a candle holder out on top before when playing. Just to note, your cat probably won't appreciate being used under the mat, even if it is asleep when you start. Though mobile terrain shifting in the middle of the game could make for a very interesting feature. <laughs> Now, once everyone has uh, their army set up, you get 30 crystals. Um, these just look like your typical um, florist crystals. And you're going to use those to purchase two of your units to start on the map. They got to start near your base. Now, the goal of Flick Wars is to eliminate your target before you are eliminated yourself. Your target is player to your left, which means you're the target of the player on your right. Every other player is friendly to you. While you can bump anyone's pieces, you can only attack your target and the units of the players targeting you. A player is eliminated if at the end of the round, they have no units left on the board. Certainly an obvious enough losing condition for a battle. Yep. Now, each round, players are going to pick between doing one of two things, either a command action or activating a unit. At the end of each round, there's a little bit of a cleanup thing where you get this that got accidentally flipped off the board and put them back on. During a command action, you're going to get two things. You get two of them. One of them is to move your units on the board. No move, not attack. Or deploy new units. So you can do two deploys or two moves and a move and a deploy or so on. To deploy a new unit, you just pay the cost in crystal shown on the card and put it out within range two of your base. Note, there's no way in this game to get new crystals. Once you bought all your units, you're out. So no flick sappers who can invade the enemy base and steal their treasury. <laughs> Maybe we have an expansion possibility. Uh, possibly, I could see it. Now, moving in Flick Wars is, of course, done by flicking. You pick a unit, you flick it. If you happen to knock other things around while doing so, so be it. They end up where they land. The only additional rule is that if you aren't careful and flick one of your units into an enemy base, you destroy that unit. Not ideal for the dexterity uninclined. No. Now, the option, other option is to activate a unit. Now, when you activate a unit, you get one flick. Now, this could be a move flick, which I've already basically explained, or an attack flick. To attack, your unit has to be in range of an enemy unit. And there's uh, four range rulers included. Um, these are like, uh, I don't know if it's not inches, but like the longest range isn't very long is what I have to say. You've got to be pretty close to be able to attack. To attack, you again flick, just like moving, but if you hit your opponent's disc, you destroy it, flipping over to the debris side. Every tile's two-sided. Debris stays on the field, being annoying and debris and getting in everyone's way. 
Next year, flick damage control. Bulldozers and dump trucks to clear the battlefield. Just kidding. <laughs> now, along with this, every unit in the game has special abilities. Uh, these come into play when you activate them. Now, most of these give units additional flicks, right? So, because otherwise you're never going to hit anything. You're going to move in and then you're just going to be sitting there waiting to be attacked, right? So any unit with Blitz gets an additional flick if it starts its turn without any enemies nearby. Or a unit with Speed gets a number of additional flicks. Like Speed 3 gives you three additional flicks. Charge gives you an additional flick if you bump an enemy when moving. So you bump into them and then you can attack them right away. There are a ton of other abilities. Some are not flick-based. There's like Shield, which allows you to survive your first hit. A defender, where no one can attack units that are in range three of that unit, but you can attack it, stuff like that. All kinds of different abilities, the kind of things you see in miniature war games. Unfortunately, nothing that really helps those who aren't good at flicking things. No, not at all. And that we'll get to in a bit. Because <laughs> after taking your one action, um, you do get a chance to spend crystals to take additional command actions. Uh, note, these can only be done on units that haven't activated that turn. So it's just another way to spend your money. Uh, we found most games, you're going to spend all your money you can to put out units, and you'll have one or two left over for those little bonus moves. We found those particularly useful when you make a bad move where you take a move action and get a little too close for comfort, and then you run away. Uh, play continues around the table until one player is eliminated, with the player targeting that player winning the game. Note, this does mean that it's possible for a player to mess up and cause someone else to win by attacking the wrong, taking out someone that isn't their target. Uh, in addition to these rules, there are a full set of cooperative rules. These were unlocked in the last Kickstarter. These also include the rules to play solo, which I thought was interesting. These cooperative rules have a team of players face off against a number of AI opponents. The opponent's abilities differ based on what faction you pick of the six, and they are ranked, like the orange faction is the easiest to beat and the black's the hardest. Um, players will be flicking their units as normal, but the enemy movement is all being driven by a card-based AI, where you're going to put down a card and then put another card facing another way, and it's going to tell you who they're going to target and how far they're going to move and so on. Movement for the bad guys, there's no flicking, they just use the range rulers. So like everything moves like range three towards whatever target the card says. The way the game works is players win if they defeat all the AI opponents, um, whereas the AIs win if they get a set number of hits against the player's base. So as a less than skilled flicker, I want to move with range roll, roll rulers too. Yeah. At that point, though, you're just playing a normal miniature game. <laughs> Yes. So overall, uh, like I said, it, it's a it's a miniature skirmish game. It really is. It's it's you get a limited number of units on the battlefield. You need to wipe out your targets units. You can bring more units on. You start by building your armies by picking cards to represent them, set up the battlefield, determine who your target is, who's targeting you, put out your units and fight. The difference here, of course, is that movement and attacking is done by flicking instead of rolling dice or measuring range rulers. And that's where this game really stands or falls with most players. And that's exactly it, right? I personally have enjoyed flick boards going back to the first time I tried the prototype. Like I said, I've got a long working relationship with Andrew and that's because I dig this game. Back when then the bases were actually round discs that were on the battlefield and could move around and you could flick them. The crystals were plastic poker chips and I used, like I said, a candlestick and shoved a wooden bowl under the map at the time. And it's been interesting to see how the games evolved. And I got to say, I was genuinely happy when it funded on Kickstarter the second time because the, the, the tweaks he made seemed to have worked. And I really do think this game deserves to be out there. Yeah, and to be fair, you are a huge fan of flicking mm -hmm. games in general, be it cards, penguins, or what have you. Totally fair. I'm impressed by the, the end result, uh, the, this retail version. Uh, the game has increased from four to six factions. Um, everyone knows I like some asymmetry, so having six different factions that actually play different, feel different, is really nice to see. Uh, the wooden half spheres is a nice touch. Uh, like at least they give you something to do the 3D scenery with, not just relying on what you have in your basement or game room. And the included battle mat is nice. Like the fact it comes with a battle mat almost offsets the annoying size of the box. I, I, I don't know. I would have preferred the mat separate. Like send me the map in a tube, but then he got two different boxes, you're shipping and increased cost. And how does a retail store keep them together? I get that there's a problem, but I hate the size of that box. Yeah, the terrain method is definitely cool. Now, I was doing some research on neoprene today, and while the general opinion is only ever roll it, 
there are a number of ways to get creases out of neoprene and a higher quality, thicker neoprene does tend to crease less obviously yeah. if it is folded in a box in the first place. Now, I just look at any of the legendary games from Upper Deck. They come with neoprene mats that you fold in half and put in the box, and the boxes are much more reasonably sized. Now, this is larger than those, and it might even be thicker, so I don't know. I, again, it is what it is. Uh, to, to be honest, the box is the worst part of this game. Like, it's huge. It's not that well made. Like, there's just cardboard dividers in it, and there's no real spot. They just kind of separate the various components, not holding them in place. I get admit, after my first game using this version, I just baggied all the factions separately and shoved them where they fit. Um, the overall production of this game, I'm sorry to say, feels a little subpar. Like, like you look at this game, and there's just something about it. You're like, yeah, yeah, this is an indie game funded on Kickstarter that's been self-published which it is, so fair enough. It looks like you'd expect, I guess. Just things like the, the card quality. Um, the half spheres are like look like something I picked up at, you know, uh, I don't know, craft supply store. Michael says it, says it yeah. doesn't, doesn't look like a board game component. Um, the florist crystals, right? Like it just looks like something someone put together in the basement. It just doesn't have the polish you see in most modern board games, even modern Kickstarter games. Like it just lacks that punch. Yeah, combined with the extended delay in shipping the product after the Kickstarter, I don't doubt that this game may have left a bad taste in the mouth of many. It, to me, seems a lot like the cards, the rulers, and the faction discs are all you really need mm. to buy as the game. The mat, the crystals, uh, and lumps under your scenery can be really easily sourced locally with less hassle and potentially less cost. Mm -hmm. This would bring the game down to something of a much more reasonable shipping size, which makes it, again, easier to get into stores and onto shelves. And to be honest, what you just said still exists. You can still get the print and play version of the game. If you go to GameCraft or you can order that and that's what it is. It's it's the rule book and the, the rulers and the units. And then you supply the rest yourself. So that is still a valid option, but that's not the kind of thing you're going to find on your shop's floor shelf. And I, and I get it, right? That's the whole... Every miniature game has had this problem for years, right? What do you put in the box? Like, can now that everyone has armies, can I sell the latest version of Warhammer 40k by just putting out a hardcover rule book? Right. They tried that, it didn't work. And then they found out that people new into the hobby want everything, they want a range ruler, even though they have a tape measure at home, right? So I, I understand where where the company I'm sure was sitting here, the fence they were on trying to decide what to do. Now, as for these production shortcomings, I on a positive note, none of this affects the gameplay. And that is where this game shines. I really do dig this game. This is a very easy to teach game. It's quick to set up. It's, it's a full-fledged war game with a unique main mechanic. There's very little games doing something similar to this. Uh, the only other two that I can think of that are strategic dexterity games like this that aren't just, you know, racing or, you know, flicking your penguins around a board is Flick Fleets which is a really cool game uh, using spaceships and flick them up, which is a cowboy and, and in Indian style game where you're, you flick to attack each other. Those are the two that come to mind. The thing is, this adds that 3D playing field, which lacks in both those other games. Both of those, you just set up your board. Uh, flick Fleet, you might put out some planets, but there's no like gravity or effects or anything. Whereas Flick them up, yeah, there's some cactuses you put out and stuff, but like that whole neoprene mat with stuff shoved under it is just so brilliant, right? Like that's, that's the killer app. Having things both under and over the mat brings it to the next level. Everyone I played this with instantly gets hooked that first time they make a bank shot going up the side of a hill and having it slide right into the perfect spot or taking out an enemy or doing a jump shot over a ridge into another valley. Stuff like that is what makes this game. Yeah, I think this game is going to be a huge win for some, but simply a polite pass for other people. Yeah, I totally agree. Like I dig Flick Wars and you pointed it out, I'm biased. I am a huge fan of dexterity games in general and flicking games specifically. As a flicking game, Flick Wars is brilliant. The thing is, if you don't like flicking games, you're probably not going to enjoy Flick Wars. Now, I will admit, it does add some strategy and tactics to a flicking dexterity game. You are still, though, going to win or lose, not based on your strategy or tactics or what units you picked. It's a lot of it's still going to be based on your ability to flick a wooden disc over a neoprene mat. And because of that, this game is no way, in any way, going to be for everyone. 
Well, for a more in-depth look at Flick Wars, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews. And now, the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and cool gaming stuff that has been going on. Now, I don't have a lot for this week um, for the podcast here. We just did our review segment, and those are the games I played this last week, as I got in a couple plays of each of those. So we've already kind of talked about those. So what I will do, I'll, just a little bit more info. Um, the kids and I did spend an afternoon playing around with Flick Wars. Uh, the most notable thing here, though, was how much it blew their minds, right? For one, this is their first flicking game, which I know is shame. I should have shown them pitch card years ago. It just never came out at the right time. Um, so at first, they were confused and bewildered. Uh, they just were like, what is this? What do you do? I don't understand. You know, where are the dice? I don't, I, but then became fascinated by it. And we're surprisingly good at it. Now, one thing that did come out during the game, which is something I'm now struggling with, is dealing with a daughter who doesn't like losing all the time. Uh, it seems as she gets older, Big G is getting to a point where if she doesn't win a game, she's starting to equate that with the game not being fun. Now, I know you've been playing with your kids possibly more than I have even. Have you run into this yet? Now, I have to admit this isn't something specifically I've gotten into my kids, though I admit I've seen it with other players at the table in Windsor even. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the the real lack of fun winning and, and compared with winning issue that we've run into is unfortunately with Hogwarts Battle. Now, not the base box, but the monster box of monsters. Mm. That is such a tough expansion that they aren't looking forward to playing the game. They aren't asking me to play the game anymore because we've just been so badly trounced by it mm -hmm. that they they're kind of hesitant to sit down again where they just know where and that's not one of the that's where all of us are going to get crushed right yeah i don't know I'm, I'm not sure even how to deal with this like we've talked about it before where i don't let the kids win and i don't really want to start doing that either like i, I don't want to start giving in I, I maybe it's just a teenager thing right she's a teenager and she's getting frustrated that her parents keep being here at games i i don't know i i like i haven't decided what i should do about this yet like i've sat down and kind of talked to her about it like we realized didn't you have fun playing like even though you lost didn't you remember when you did this awesome thing in the game you know trying to bring out the highlights i don't know maybe i just need to let her play with her sister and and play the the boss for a while i'm not sure yeah and i think and that may just be it i mean you know she's a teenager now and and it's I, I have a teenage daughter as well. Yeah. It's it's an experience, um, you know, especially especially as, uh, you know, a male who hasn't dealt with what they've dealt dealt with ever. Um, and so there, there's definitely a little bit of backing off uh, and, and maybe it is a matter of letting Big G trounce little G in some games a little bit. And, you know, being there as the teacher and not right. the player so that they, they don't have the experience of, of getting trounced by mom and dad because mom and dad are better game players. And that's just, just that. And I, and I don't think it's fair to um, let them, you know, let them win. I, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, that doesn't help them either. Uh, yeah. But giving them the experience of being able to win in their own situation yeah. is certainly an option. And, you know, we live in, in, in interesting times uh which doesn't make anything else easier either yeah definitely true so the other thing we did do this past week is we spent an afternoon at deanna's mom's uh while there we played a few games of orleans uh was brenda's first time seeing the game so we did start off with the base game i actually kind of broke the rule i said in the review though now i think it's true is is i did put the original encounter deck back in and stuff though i don't think that would have made a difference i think like ha her not having memorized what was coming. It didn't matter. The random events were random events were either way. Um, and we did use the original beneficial deeds board, which I almost regret because man, did that hammer home how much I do not like the original beneficial deeds board compared to the new one. Like I, I found like Deanna was complaining too. She's like, what the heck? All you get is some coins. Like, I don't want to give up my people to go up there. It's almost like it's an afterthought. Like, oh, we got to put in something so that you can get rid of people in your bag. I, it was weird. And like, I was so happy to, to get rid of that for the second time. But yeah, I, intrigue was terrible. Like it really was. It, I, that intrigue board, I don't know. Like that takes a certain type of group to enjoy using that, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Well, I'm definitely looking at trying that game again with new bits because, uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. And, and from what you described, other than that one board, uh, yeah. I, I, I really enjoy the like of all of them, including the delivery uh, portion. Yeah, I just intrigued. No, I like I, yeah. I don't know. I, like I, that's one of those I'm tempted like throw it in the expansion box. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just not our style. Yeah. So how about a look ahead? I don't know this week. Like uh, we've been pretty hardcore, not hardcore, but like planning ahead more. But we kind of got through the stuff I planned to get through. Um, Intrigue was the final game that I had picked up at Origins 2018, uh, which man. That was a while ago now. No, 2019. Yeah, 2019. 2019. 2019. Still, it was over a year ago, right? So that was the final game. Uh, sorry, it's not true. Technically, we still have Vinho Deluxe. I did produce an initial thoughts review, but I did want to get back to that one with the um, the other side of the board, the um, the other vintage. And because of the pandemic, we haven't had time. But I do have content out there, and I have talked favorably about the game. So it's not like I feel like I've fallen down on my obligation, but I do feel like I, I, I owe... Um, I'm drawing a blank on the company. Eagle Griffin, thank you, head, for reminding me. I do feel like I owe Eagle Griffin more than that. But as far as the pile of obligation is, we're now in a place I'm comfortable. Like, like I don't feel like we're behind anymore. Right. So I don't know where we're going to go next. Um, I think I'm going to look to get Animal Empire to the table. We've got the unboxing out there. The problem with that game is it doesn't sound like it's going to work well two-player. And it doesn't seem like something I really want to introduce the kids to. Not, not that there's anything not kitty to it. But it doesn't. That seems more of a game player's game, than, and it doesn't seem like something they'd be all that interested in. So maybe I don't know. Um, now maybe I'll sit down and read through the Tales from the Loop starter set. Uh, again, there's no chance I'm going to get that to the table anytime soon, but it might be an interesting read and give us some more RPG content. So those are the two I'm thinking about. But I don't know. I, I haven't quite decided if that's it. Now what I do have is a pile of new stuff that's shown up, and we have, as I showed during our coffee break, the new bars for the lights. So it's getting to be time to record some more unboxing videos. So that might happen before next week if I can get those done. So uh, now that we got the new lights set up and I can should be able to get even better better images than before, maybe I can even try to get the, the camera to work too. <laughs> so that may be it. I don't know. I have, I have the, no hard, solid plan, unfortunately, this, this coming week. We'll see. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Andrew Dacey, thank you. I am Tuzano. Thanks, Mom. Misdirected Mark, join the Misdirected Mark night. Uh, join the Misdirected Mark team every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering at twitch.tv slash misdirected mark. Or find them on your podcatcher as the Misdirected Mark podcast, MMP. Uh, Evil John, you up for a game this Sunday? We owe you some. We should get that done. I think, uh, I think that there's our, our week in review. We are going to try to play an online game with one of our patrons that we have owed a game for too long now. Yeah, hopefully he didn't actually mute me for uh, joking with him on his uh, Twitter stream earlier today. Oh, I didn't today. see that one. So. <laughs> uh, Wayne Humphrey. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis has crashed to the ground, you always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, it would be awesome if you headed over to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and tipped your bellhop. Well, remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit Podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. every Tuesday morning. Well, that wraps up the time we have here for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and be sure to stick around and join us in the Penthouse Suite for the after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.